we are talking to Dejan Antoine, who is a life sciences licensing attorney. She's going to talk to us all about a great pivot that she had that brought her love of law, business, and healthcare into one degree and one amazing job that a lot of us have not really heard of. This is the career episode that you want to make sure you listen to. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Break Into Law School. I am your host, Lavetta Jenkins. Welcome, Dejan. Hello. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I am so happy to have you because I feel like this is a subject I can learn a lot about. You are a life sciences licensing attorney, but you had an unusual road to law school. Tell me how you got your start, where you got your start, and how that led you to this. Yeah, happy to. So I started out being that kid that was good in math and science, that loved being good at math and science, and thought that that meant I had to be a doctor. When my mom died, unfortunately, and suddenly of a heart attack, it started to put some different things into perspective for me. I was um, 13 years old when that happened, and I tried to figure out who could have saved my mom if the doctors couldn't. What could have saved her if their interventions and, and tools and knowledge and processes couldn't? And um, I started doing research, and this thought came to me, what if my mom had had a heart transplant? What but without having to wait on that long transplant list. And I discovered that no one had ever created an artificial heart. So as a young teenager, I set my sights on being on the scientific team that was going to be responsible for creating the first fully functional artificial heart. And what degree did I need to pursue to make that happen? Uh, and I discovered that there are biomedical engineers out there who create prosthetics and who work on materials that can be patches on hearts. And I was fascinated and decided that I was going to pursue a career in science and engineering. I fell in love with the science program at a small university in New Orleans called Xavier University of Louisiana. Uh, they're known for graduating the most African-Americans who go to medical school, but they've also had a pretty strong foothold in past years um, in terms of graduating the most African-Americans who have physics degrees, and they partner with other institutions for you to pursue an engineering degree. So I did a dual degree program in undergrad. It's called a 3-2. Many other universities do this as well, and majored in physics and biomedical engineering. I always thought that I was going again into that cardiovascular research space, but by the time I finished my five and a half year program, all my job offers were rescinded because I was in an off hiring cycle in the 2008 recession and, and global economic crisis. And so these external forces really pushed me to start looking at some alternative career plans because the one that I had sort of been set into motion in my teenage years was no longer available to me. So it really started you know, with my interest in math and science. It started with a little bit of tragedy. It started with a little bit of global forces, if you will, that caused me to look into some different things. Um, so I began to look at business roles as my research jobs were drying up and interviews and things were being canceled. Accenture was one of the companies that I was looking at sort of as a backup plan to my science career. Um, they're a behemoth that does outsourcing and management consulting and tech consulting. And my sister had worked for them after her MBA program. So I was kind of familiar with the company and, and you know what they did. And so I had a really good run in my interviews with Accenture. And they also went on a hiring freeze and you know weren't sending out as many offers as they originally intended. But I kept in contact with my recruiter and um, I got a job managing a team in a call center, which gave me great leadership opportunity, but there just wasn't a lot of upward mobility in that particular role. Over the course of that year, like I said, kept in contact with recruiters doing that kind of legwork and Accenture came back to the table and all they needed from me was proof that I had graduated and they extended me an offer based in their Houston, Texas office. So when I start as a management consulting, I'm thinking I'm going to be able to use some aspects of my technical degree. It may not necessarily be the biomedical components because they didn't really have a, a practice there, especially not out of Houston. But the tech consulting piece, I would still be able to use those problem solving skills. And, you know, maybe I would keep looking for something in the cardiovascular research space. I did end up starting in tech consulting. 
However, the business need was in banking because there were so many projects as a result of that 2008 economic crisis, the banks were running to the Deloitte's and Accenture's of the world for help to redesign their business processes to comply with the new regulation. And um, even though there were a ton of oil and gas projects in Houston, where I was like, oh God, this is where I'm going to end up. I never ended up in oil and gas. I ended up because of the business need in financial services. So I'm kind of being pushed by these forces that are not in my control. I'm pivoting industries, I'm pivoting functions. And when I get started on these projects, I very quickly get tapped on the shoulder. And um, my supervisors are saying, you know, you really have a, a, a very keen business sense. You should try some change management consulting because we have a lot of that work going on. So I end up doing and specializing in change management in the financial services. All of my projects were in banking. After those first two projects, my supervisors were just taking me wherever they were going. And I was happy to follow, happy to be productive, happy to not be on the bench. And so I, I allowed that part of my career to be really honestly dictated by others. Um, I was excited to learn. I was excited to do new things. I was excited to travel for a while every week. All of that was fun but I was not fulfilled. That part of me, that little girl who wanted to be on the team to create the first fully functional artificial heart wanted to get back to healthcare. So I stopped and I, in my analytical nature, made a spreadsheet of all the different graduate degrees that I could pursue that would get me back to science and had a lot of conversations with a lot of different folks in those fields and then ended up deciding that the things I learned about myself in consulting, that I like client and professional services, that I like project-based work, that I like the pace of that work, I like the variety of functional roles that I get to interact with in that space, that I wanted to keep that. And one way that I could get back to healthcare and science and keep that those components and things that I learned about myself and bring my business sense in was to do a JD MBA and through that program, through my summer internships. We can talk about that if that's of interest, but I did a little bit of everything. And I figured out that there was a role in law that combined business. It was a transactional corporate role. It also combined law. It was a practicing attorney role and it combined science. It was actually writing the contracts for the scientists who were doing the kind of research I once wanted to do. So writing clinical trial agreements, um, writing research collaboration agreements, writing sponsored research agreements with universities. Um, there was a lawyer that does that. And so I could piece together all these different components from science and law and business and put them together um, as a life sciences licensing attorney. Didn't even know that job existed until I became a, a law school student. But but it exit. But at, once I did realize it existed, um, I, I realized it was a good it was a good fit to put all those pieces together. So that's a very long story, but that is how I ended up here. But if you think about it, it's classic. You know what old people say in the Bible says all things working together. You had this one catalyst that happened that sparked the interest as a child, and even though it was a sad and traumatic thing. It sparked an interest that set you on a path to gather information, education, and knowledge to put you at a place where you could pivot and take everything you had and put it somewhere new. It's not often that you find something that, especially you didn't even know it existed, but it's not often that you find something that lets you use all parts of you. Being women of color, we often have things that we like, but they don't always crossover. They don't always overlap. And it's a great thing to see somebody who was good at math, good at science, and then found her way into law and brought all of those things together, even with healthcare. I had no idea that there was a life sciences licensing attorney. Had no idea. You are the very first one I've ever met. And of course, we need to dive into that because you said somebody, and this never really dawns on you, somebody's got to write these clinical trial uh, forms and laws and things of that nature. When you started in like undergrad for this, were you aware of all the classes you would need to take for this? Or is it something you found out? It's something I discovered. So in my practice, the vast majority of attorneys in this group have science degrees. Many of them have advanced science degrees. So at the law firm that I joined is called Cooley. Um, they have a very robust life sciences practice, it, licensing and, you know, other functional roles. And in the licensing group, many, many, many people have PhDs. 
in molecular chemistry and biology and all the things, right? There are, I think in, in my group, there were two, maybe three people who um, did not have a science degree at all. So in terms of what is the required coursework, technically there's none. Um, there, are, there are very few roles that actually require you to have a specific degree in law, you know, absent being like a patent prosecutor. There are um, not really required courses or required degree programs that people are really looking for when they're hiring you. But in my group, there are many, many people who have very deep scientific and technical experience. So what helps in this role? It definitely helps to be comfortable with science, to be familiar with science, and to have a scientific degree because our clients are actually working on creating and developing new patient therapies, medical devices, things of that nature. And so when you're talking to the founders of this company, when you're talking to um, someone on the science and, and technical team, and you're trying to translate the type of research they want to perform into a contract, it's very helpful to know how the science works, because you're going to have to write definitions in this contract that that cover the type of product that they already have. And in many cases, the type of product they're trying to create, but doesn't yet exist. And so having an understanding of the components of an antibody, um, being able to go and watch a YouTube video to refresh your memory on proteins and enzymes. Those are the kinds of things I find myself doing very often trying to dust off, you know, my undergraduate degree to understand how I need to describe this in the contract and to understand what it is actually in in the business that my you know client is 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 in. So it's helpful to have science a science background. It's helpful to be comfortable with scientific concepts. Um, but the skill you really need is something you can develop over time, which is translating their business and scientific goals into a legal contract to help them work with other institutions to try to ultimately create a therapy or a device that will help someone's you know, medical needs or meet someone's medical needs. You said proteins and enzymes, and I instantly was like, oh, God, those are things that I do have back in the recesses of my mind. And I instantly thought, OK, she has to know not only law, but how these things work together, because you do need one for the other. And I think that that is ultimately what happened with your career. You needed one thing to get to another. And that led you to this pivot. Did you find it hard to kind of be at one place and say, OK, well, now I'm going to go to law because I found this. Was it a hard pivot for you or was it just like I'm going to close my eyes and take this blind leap and I know I'm going to end up where I want to be? I am not a blind leap kind of person. You made a biblical reference earlier. If we want to stick with that, I am Thomas. You are going to have to come and show me those holes. OK, um, so there was no blind leap. It was a very much a, a, a well researched, well thought out and planned that still has to have some element of trust and faith, right? Because we can't predict and account for everything. But it was very much me having conversations with a ton of people. And that's something I always try to advise um, students, prospective students, prospective attorneys, have informational interviews, talk to people who are in the space and industry you're in, ask them questions about what they do, what their day in the life is like, tell them what you're interested in and ask them, you know, what would they recommend? Is there a person they would suggest that you look at? Is there a, a job or a function or a role or a company that they suggest that you research based on what you're interested in? Because you want to be in a place where you're comfortable. You want to be in a place where you're using your skills. So to get there, the pivot was hard in the sense that it took time. It was hard in the sense that it was very expensive. It was hard in the sense that I was in a place where I was, I felt like I didn't deserve to be there. I had done all the things, right? I did the research programs. Um, I published some of my research in undergrad. Um, I had done the internships, right? And yet somehow I still wasn't a scientist. That's not fair. And now that I have these new skills, I'm not as good of a scientist as I would be before. So if I want to go back and get a master's in engineering, what does that look like? Am I starting over? So it was hard for me to accept where I was and the fact that I needed to pivot first and foremost. That was tricky. And then the pivot itself logistically, a lot of people still saw me as a change management consultant because the first thing I actually tried to do was find a different job. 
Um, and so it was hard to shake the identity that had been built for myself through my years in consulting. That was difficult. The next thing was that coming into law, the structure of recruiting in law is, I think, very unfair, particularly given so many law school students come straight from undergrad. I, I'm not saying that someone going straight from undergrad to law school has no idea about what they want to do. There's a lot of folks who do a lot of research. They have lawyers in their family. They may not have lawyers in their family, but they're figuring their way out and they're passionate about things and they're very self-aware. That's very possible. But you come into law school and in your first summer, before you even really take in many law school classes, people are asking you to kind of commit to what you're going to be doing for the next several years. And I think that's really unfair, right? Life did give me the opportunity to try some jobs out, right? And I discovered some new things about myself. But if you come straight through, you may not necessarily have that same opportunity. And so what was tricky for me was trying to put the pieces together on what I wanted in my career without having experience in law and not having any lawyers in my family. So, you know, I've listed a bunch of different things that were difficult, but, you know, I, I think if I were to sum it up, it was trying to find a role that achieved what I was really interested in and what I was good at. I think it was shaking my former identity um, internally and externally, right? Me accepting it was hard and also other people getting what I was trying to do and what pivot I was trying to make. I, I had to sell other people on that and that can be tricky. Um, and then I think, you know, logistically, you know, law school is not cheap and I didn't come from a family that made, you know, much money at all. And, you know, I was trying to build wealth for myself for the first time when I, you know, was at Accenture and I kind of had a late start. So there are some of those logistic challenges, I think, that made that pivot tricky as well. You mentioned interns, and I think that having an internship is a really good thing to help people kind of figure out exactly what they want to do, how it really, really works. While you were interning, was there an experience that you can say really helped you understand, okay, this is exactly what I want to do? Or was there something that you said, okay, this is what I'm not going to do? I had the benefit in being a JD MBA of having three summers. And I knew coming in that there are these big categories in law. You can be a litigator, you can be a corporate attorney. That That's kind of the main split. Some people would put regulatory maybe alongside that because it's not quite litigation, not quite transactional. So I knew coming in that I was going to have to make a law versus business choice, right? Because my graduate degree, I actually did another dual degree program, a JD MBA. So I was making personally a law versus business decision. And coming in for me, the JD was primary and the MBA was secondary. I knew within law as my primary degree, I was going to have to make a litigation versus transactional, maybe regulatory decision. So I started having those conversations early about like what that looks like, who's successful in those kinds of roles, what type of personality would you need to have to succeed in that kind of space. I knew coming in, I was probably going to end up as a transactional attorney because I was very much a business oriented kind of person. Even when I was in science, I was interested in the business of science as well. And many scientists are not interested in anything, but you know what they're researching. Um, so I knew I would probably end up in transactional law, but I used my summers to actually test that out. And so in my 1L summer, I did a litigation internship at a firm that was heralded as, you know, having very like trial tested lawyers. Um, and I did it in healthcare and intellectual property litigation, right? It's trying to stay close to science and technology in a practice that, you know, functionally I'll be a litigator, but I'm still doing science and, and kind of healthcare. And then through my informational interviews, I ended up connecting with an alum of my law school who offered me an opportunity to come in-house at a hospital in the Middle East. So that was a very unique experience to spend some time in Doha during Ramadan. It was a very interesting cultural and work experience. The hospital that I was working with was not yet open. So we were dealing with business and legal issues of how do we get to our opening. And so I split my 1L summer, litigation in-house, all healthcare and science related. Uh, my second summer was actually my after my first year of business school. So I did a traditional healthcare business school internship in marketing. Uh, through my informational interviews, I discovered that if you want to be in a business role and you want to move up into some form of an executive space in healthcare, you're going to have to come through sales and marketing. 
I discovered that. I learned that again through those conversations. So I did a marketing role to see what that would actually look like. And I did it with a company that I had been exploring and, and, and talking to when I was an undergrad, right? They have a really strong medical device practice. So I did that for my second summer. My next summer was technically my 2L summer. And so I went back to the firm that I worked at as a 1L. That's a very common experience. If you have a good experience as a 1L, they offer you the opportunity to do a touchback summer. So I did do that, but this was my legal transactional summer. So I did a healthcare transactions internship that was, it was pretty much M&A with some regulatory stuff sprinkled in. Um, mergers and acquisitions with some regulatory things sprinkled in. And I split that summer as well. I spent some time at Cooley, where I ultimately ended up joining. And their transactions practice, I had discovered through informational interviews, was life sciences licensing. And so I was writing contracts for pharmaceutical biotech type companies, writing those kind of clinical trial agreements, negotiating those things, supporting them when they're doing some of their corporate transactions as well, but primarily focused on their scientific and technical contracts. And so each one of the buckets that you can do in law, I decided I was going to dabble in. I had ruled out regulatory work, having those informational interviews again, to know that that wasn't going to be for me and that wasn't what I was interested in. I had ruled out um, patent prosecution, which was the main practice that I knew about as a technical person coming in. I ruled that out for a number of reasons. And even though it's the most technical role I think you can have, like it's probably the closest to the science and the technology that you could be in, um, in the biomedical space, you, you pretty much do need to have an advanced degree to really succeed. And I realized that there wasn't that much variety in that work. And I knew, again, going back to Accenture, I like this project-based work. I like this fast-paced work. I like the variety of the projects I get. I like the variety of the people that I talk to. And there's less of that. You, you kind of have one key client and the work is pretty repeatable. The technology is different, but you're kind of doing the same thing each time. In life sciences licensing, I got more variety and it ended up being a better fit for me. So my internships through law school and my MBA program helped really to refine my experience and refine what I learned from the initial conversations I was having. And um, yeah, I, I, I found litigation was not for me. I learned a lot of things through those internships. So you mentioned briefly about informational interviews. Tell us a little bit about the power that you found from going to those and how other people can benefit from them. Yeah, I keep harping on them because they've been so key to my discovery, my, my professional discovery. I came in, again, not knowing the job that I had existed. I came in being aware of patent prosecution because as an engineer, I went to these conferences, including the National Society of Black Engineers Conference, and there were um, intellectual property firms and the U.S. Patent Trademark Office. They were there because they wanted to get engineers and people with technical backgrounds early on to either be patent agents or to go to law school and come back. So I was aware of that. So when I'm having conversations with folks, I'm coming in and sometimes I'm emailing people cold. Sometimes these are people that I do know. Sometimes I have had a warm introduction from someone, but effectively what I'm doing is talking to someone who has a job in the space that I'm interested in and asking them what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. And the power that you mentioned from those conversations is refining my own thoughts and processes and what I'm going to do and choices. Uh, my father used to have this saying of like, chew the meat, spit out, spit out the bone. That's effectively what I would do after getting information from all of these different folks is say, you know, I hear them saying that if I'm going to be a litigator, I need to expect to work on the same case for many, many years. That's going to drive me insane. That person who likes fast paced project work is going to bang her head against the wall. OK, when I'm working on the same thing for three, five, sometimes 10 years, I can't do that. That's not for me. When I have these conversations, I hear that as a corporate attorney, there's a switching cost. You are going to bill your time to 10, 15, 20 different clients in a day. Can you manage what that looks like and how that disrupts your ability to just write a contract if you're also responding to this email and you also have these other clients and you also have multiple contracts that might be going out for review and coming back in. And what does that switching cost look like when you have much more 
a, a higher number of clients that you're serving in a, in a given day. And if I had to sign up for one or the other of those things, my personality, what I know about myself is I'm going to like that project-based switching work. I'm going to be able to manage that. I'm a very process-oriented person. Um, I'm very organized. That makes so much more sense to me. That works better with how I think, how my brain works and, and what I'm willing to tolerate than me working on one, two or three things for an extended period of time. I learned that, you know, as a litigator, you're coming in on the back end when a problem has already happened. And so many people love fixing and trying to make that right and advocating in that space. I like to think more strategically about how things should work and be designed from the onset. But I, and while I may have had some idea about that, I might've been able to research it online and read about it, hearing someone talk about it and talk about how they live it, there's so much power in that story that I could apply to my life and what I know about myself and what I've learned about myself through my experiences to refine what I wanna do going forward. So. I, I guess the power of those conversations was my ability to learn and get new information and apply that to my personal kind of context and decide on something that actually is a good fit for me rather than sort of being put into the herd at, you know, we call it OCI, but like on campus interviewing and end up in some place that, you know, I end up being miserable. I love the fact that you said, you know, you're a person who works very well in a fast paced kind of thing. I can't do that. And so, but I'm also not the kind of person that can sit there and work on something for three, four, five, ten 10 years. That I think would drive me up a wall too. But there are some people who love all of the intricacies and all the fine details. And you really drove, drove it home. You have to have these informational interviews with people and talk to them. It's not just the glamour of it. What does a day to day, day in the life look like to you? So for you being a life sciences licensing attorney, what does your day to day look like? Yeah, um, it's different now that I'm in house, but I'll talk about firm life first, because I think as far as I understand it, most people who will likely be listening to this will probably be going to a firm before they're doing kind of what I'm doing today. I'll describe a week in the life because, you know, I just described any given day. <laughs> You have all these different clients that you're working with, and that may not be what it looks like. So as a junior associate starting early at a law firm as a life sciences licensing attorney, I am working with mid-level associates and senior level associates, sometimes partners, on smaller transactions. So there's a, a wide range of complexity in my role. I could be working on something as small as a confidentiality agreement, which many people are feel familiar with what that looks like. Um, I'm just doing it for biotech companies who want to work together or consultants, maybe individual consultants that they may want to bring on all the way to the kind of contract that would govern like Pfizer and BioNTech. We, many people know they created a COVID vaccine, but those are two different companies and they have to figure out what is each person going to put together in the pot in order for this vaccine to happen? What patents do they have? What know-how do they have? What resources are they going to use? Who's going to actually test it? Who gets to make the decisions? How much is one person going to pay? Are you going to pay now or are you going to pay later? How much do you get on the back end if this ends up being successful? How much liability are you going to take? And those contracts can be 60 to 200 page contracts. And they can be very complex if you want to break down, you know, all the different ways in which a, a pharmaceutical or biopharmaceutical product gets made. And then there's a lot of stuff in between. So as a junior associate, you're starting off on the less complex side. And so you're looking at working with mid-level and senior associates on projects that they have that basically they're siphoning off and giving to you. You're going back and having conversations and revising them and learning what those key components are. That gives you the building blocks to move on to the next phase of particular contracts that are slightly more complex. So these are more research agreements, but they're very discreet in nature and, and, and in scope. Um, they're not the big Pfizer, BioNTech type contract. You're doing one little project, 
who gets the data, what do you need to figure out? And then you're still kind of working mostly with senior associates and mid-level associates on those particular kind of projects and getting trained, right? And the number of contracts that you're working on on a day-to-day basis, it varies, but it's going to be multiple contracts and it's going to be multiple clients. I happen to have started my career at a firm that also gives junior associates a greater level of responsibility if you show that you're able to do so. And so having had clients and having run projects before, um, I was also talking to clients by myself on the phone as well, explaining certain things to them. Um, at a pretty junior level. That's not the case necessarily for everyone. It depends on the firm that you're at and how much responsibility and, you know, obviously how much you're learning and, and growing your own skills. But a week in the life for me in those first three years did also include talking to clients one-on-one with no other associates or partners on the line and explaining, you know, why I made certain changes. And that might be in the middle of working on two or three different other contracts. It also includes some corporate support. So pharmaceutical and biotech companies, they engage in mergers. They also go public, right? And all of their contracts are not leases and, you know, generally things that general corporate would work on. They have contracts that cover their intellectual property, which is where a lot of the value of the company sits. And so when diligence needs to happen on those transactions, when you need to write or summarize what those contracts look like, they're coming to folks who actually write them and do them for a living to review them, summarize them, work on them. So I sometimes end up being a specialist, if you will, or a support attorney, if you will, to the general corporate transactions. There's a lot of that when you're junior. And all of that is sort of happening on a day-to-day basis or in any given week based on your deadlines and your, you know, your clients' deadlines. As I became more senior, I have clients who are coming to me with new contracts. So I'm also fielding also kind of doing intake. You start doing a few more administrative things. Um, I start supervising junior associates, right? So now I'm managing timelines of when things need to happen. I may be talking to the client, but I'm no longer the one making the edits on those smaller agreements. And now I'm the more junior person on the more complex things. So your skills begin to evolve and the amount of independence you get and supervisory experience you get starts to shift and evolve over time. But in any given week, I would be working on Honestly, it could be 40 contracts, or if I have a a couple of big deals, it might be one or two of the more complex things with five or six smaller things that I'm managing, and then three or four smaller things I might be supervising. Um, But yeah, it could be anywhere from easily 30 to 40 different agreements that I'm working on in a week, and I'm having calls with you know, clients and revising drafts and working on revisions with people who are more senior and more junior than me. Wow, that's a busy day. And I didn't even think about who is the actual person behind the the contracts with, you know, the vaccines that we've had. I did not even think of who gets in the most trouble if something would go wrong. Which one of us is taking what percentage of, you know, the blame if something goes bad or the profits if everything goes good. Never even thought about those little intricate details or the fact that there was an attorney behind all of that. So pretty much nothing can really happen in a medical industry without a life sciences licensing attorney. Yeah, it doesn't happen because we no longer live in the day and age where companies are doing things end to end. You can look at, you know, the the financials of many of these companies over time and even in the industry and see that like long ago there were very high research budgets, right? The percentage of sales allocated to R&D was much, much higher. And now there's a lot of partnerships because no product that makes it to market probably ever came from one institution or one university. A lot of times we see things come out of a university and they get licensed to a company and then that company might work with three or four other companies before it ever makes it. And so many drugs fail. Um, so many products fail before they end up making it to the market. So there are so much, there's so many research contracts that are happening before we ever get to take a Tylenol or an Advil, or we get a prescription for insulin or, you know, et cetera. So there's so much that happens before someone gets a pacemaker put in. There's a lot of different research projects that have happened. And each one of those is governed by a contract written by someone like me. There's not a lot of diversity in the licensing field. Not a lot of racial and ethnic diversity, I should say, because actually there's a lot of gender diversity. I am in a space where there are a lot of very senior 
women attorneys with PhDs who are working on these deals and these contracts. And it is amazing because that is not the case in every area of law. Um, but there still is not a lot of racial and ethnic diversity. Um, if any, uh, we see quite a bit more folks of Asian descent actually in this space. But Black and Hispanic or Latinx, we don't have a lot of attorneys. I actually went out and tried to find all of the Black life sciences licensing attorneys. I discovered there were four of us. Um, there may be more, right? I can't say that I've been exhaustive, but of all the large firms that have practices and even some folks who have kind of gone in-house like I have recently, I found four. And so if there are any little black and brown people out there who are interested in science and may want to be a lawyer and maybe don't want to actually be in the lab forever or at all, um, I do encourage you to think about this space because my clients are not just other lawyers. My clients are business development folks. They are PhD scientists. I get to talk to people who work on the production lines. So you will get to still be you know, close to that space. Hopefully after this airs and everyone hears it, we're either going to spark some new ones or find some that are already existing. I thank you so much, Dejan, for bringing all of this to me because as someone who knew nothing about it, I feel like I might be informed. And now I know somebody was behind the Tylenol I take and lo and behold, could have been you. Thank you so much for being my guest today. I appreciated this conversation. Yeah, it was great. Thank you so much for having me.